I just wanted to say this to you directly rather than, uh, I don't know, beating around the bush on a different stream or whatever because it is the way that I feel. Okay. So, I know I'm not necessarily the most concise person. Uh huh. When you interrupt and you say, hey, I already know what you're going to say, I, I want to slap you, like, in the face. And so, how about, uh, for the sake of our relationship, you can say, hey, Connor, you're being long-winded, can you make this more concise? My issue isn't that you're long-winded. My issue is that it feels like the story that you tell or, wh or whatever you um, whatever you talk about doesn't hit the meat or meet the like central point of whatever it is I'm talking about or, or whatever the other person brought up. That's the frustrating part. It's not that it's a long way. I've talked to plenty of people that are long winded. It's fine if you're long winded, but when it, it feels like it doesn't go back to the main point, that's the thing that drives me crazy. Well, then using that as an example, if we're talking about whether or not actual justice warrior is a liar, and then I'm bringing up a example where I felt like he could have been dishonest with me. How is that not getting to the point? Because I feel like at that point, I say, I, well, first of all, I'm not even, I don't, this is a little bit of my new show. I'm not even necessarily saying he's a liar. I'm saying he lied in this circumstance. Now we could extrapolate to say, okay, well, he has a pattern of lying or something. But for you to go and bring up a story, okay, sorry, my mind just jumped through a whole bunch of hoops. This is what it feels like is happening. Mm -hmm. It feels like I'm saying, I think he lied here. And you want to say, well, I don't know if he is lying, but I think that if I say that I don't know that he's lying, you're going to think that I'm biased. So I'm going to give you a story of an example of when I'm pretty sure he lied to me just to show that I know that he's capable of lying and he has lied in the past, but I don't think he's established enough of a pattern of lying for me to actually call him a liar, but I'm not just biased because he has indeed lied to me. Yeah, I'm not thinking that far ahead. Okay, that's what it feels but, like, because I don't know why you would give an example of him lying, demonstrated that he's lying, and then use that to somehow reinforce the idea that he wasn't lying in our conversation. It feels like, what was the point because, of... Because uh, I'm trying to establish that I potentially am recognizing a pattern, and I'm trying to be forthright with the fact that I'm potentially recognizing the pattern, so it doesn't look like I'm totally sweeping. So I'm not, I'm not thinking that far ahead to, like... Uh, I don't even know what it would be like. Like, like try to dodge. Well, it like, sounds like something up. you. So, dodge. ironically, you just said what I said in way fewer words. Words you summarized it better. But when you said that, I'm just showing you that I'm starting to recognize a pattern. That feels like you're saying then essentially what I just said. That you're trying to show that. Well, I'm not biased. I, he has lied to me before, and I am recognizing that. So I'm going to put that out there first before fighting back against the fact that I don't think he's 100 percent lying here. I don't know 100 percent he's lying here. But then it's like. There, there's like, yeah, there's like a, be, yeah, a lost argument then. I can't like, even if I show you 100% like he's lying, you're like, well, I haven't seen like the absolute number of lies yet to believe that. And I was like, well, what, the, what is the point of this? Yeah. Well, okay. So now, now we're getting into a, a different topic and I appreciate the clarification that you're saying that you don't necessarily have an issue with long windedness. You feel like I'm being evasive and I'll try to speak quickly and concisely to keep that going. The, when it comes to this topic though, Lying, we swim in a world of people who are hyperbolic and propagandists all the time. And so lying means knowing information and then saying the opposite. That's how I understand it. Mm -hmm. Some of the most successful people in our space are opportunist propagandists who lie through omission. Okay. That's their entire career. Okay. Uh, okay. Wait, what is that? Or what, what argument are you furthering with that? So if I was to moral frog mm -hmm. about people who played loose with the truth or who lied through omission, I would have no one to talk to. Um, I understand what you're saying. Um, I'm doing a lot of inferencing here, okay? Um, we all do, all humans do. Okay, I just, I articulate it, but I, I, we all do a lot of inferencing, okay? In that when people say a few words, we extrapolate a lot and we infer a lot from the things that people say. I think it's pretty natural we do this, okay? When, I, when I'm talking to somebody and they say some things, there's a, there's a feeling that I get when they don't know something 
but they want to argue it because it might play into their narrative or something, um, which is fair. It happens. There, I'm sure there are times when I do this where I don't know, like, I don't know actually 100% what Fauci said, but I, I doubt Fauci would say this, right? Um, we'll, do, we'll go with that, okay? Somebody tells me, hey, uh, what about when Fauci said, Fauci said, uh, I support gain of function research because I'm a fan of Resident Evil and I want people to turn into zombies, okay? And then let's say that I fight against, I'm like, Fauci would never say that, F you, okay? That's not true. And let's say, but let's say that I take a stronger stance. I go, no, I looked, I looked at all the speeches. Fauci didn't say this, okay? No, F you, he did not say this. That's not true, okay? Even in saying that, what if I hear somebody say, Fauci didn't say that, no, that's not true. Even if somebody says, no, I think I, I looked at that speech, he didn't say it, I don't, I don't remember that, that's not true, okay? It's like, okay, even at that. But let's say that somebody did a thing to where they quoted me like a part of that speech. They were like, well, in this speech, actually, Fauci said A, B, and C. And they start quoting parts of the speech, but they're not familiar with the major incriminating part that I'm talking about. At some point, it crosses over or it changes where it's like, okay, hold on. You're not just bought into this. You're not just like rambling or you're not just like uh, arguing to argue because you agree with this ideologically. It seems like you have done some research into this. And you're either conveniently leaving out the exculpatory part or something like very, very, very wrong has happened here. Does that make sense? Not only does it make sense, but that I could give you three minute summaries of almost every creator in the space, particularly right wing ones. Uh, Lauren Chen, Tim Pool, Lauren Southern to some degree, even though I consider her a friend. Mm -hmm. And uh, you could come up with a few other ones. And I would say that they've largely made a career off of playing to their audience's bias. Sure. I agree. Yeah, I, I, I even think this of um, I, I like such an atom a lot. And I do think that they start from a position of trying to root their perspectives in truth. Particularly, I like Sitch. But I also think that there's an element of audience capture and or self-delusion where all the evidence is pointing in one direction, but then they come up with a reason for why they're going in the one that you almost could have predicted. Yeah, but I think that there's meaningfully something different happening when somebody is just like audience captured versus when somebody is like, telling an intentional lie so what was your threat so what was your threshold with sean the fact because that he brought up the, Uly the ulysses uh election means that he did some sort of research into that event but apparently didn't learn a single fact about it or learned the facts about it and knows that it's totally not comparable to what's happening today but decided to quote selectively a part of it which is like, okay, hold on, you know that this is not anywhere near what we're talking about today, but you still decided to run with this. Or I'm so sorry, how, it was a, a Hayes, so Hayes you, not Grant, I'm sorry, Hayes. So, so how do you differentiate that from people who are just uh, biased? So, so for instance, like uh, you, you and I probably still disagree on, on the Twitter files as an example, right? But I think that as I was going through that and forced to research more and more, I was realizing that nothing particularly illegal was happening. It was probably a bunch of people with predictable motivations who just went with the flow of like institutional and cultural development and never stopped to ask whether or not what they were doing could be perceived as like nefarious. And so it became like less, less nefarious over time, but I still felt like somebody should have stopped and said, hey, isn't this a little up from this this perspective and aren't we creating all these like negative perverse incentives that can be used against us in the future okay and so how do you so how do you differentiate someone who you think is, so for instance let's say we were talking about the twitter files in particular and i was saying like i feel like the government is in bed with social media blah 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 which is how i feel mm -hmm. but then um you feel like there's a bunch of contradictory evidence that i'm ignoring but i'm aware of it how do you know that's not just me being biased and it's actually me being <clears throat> So all I have is my, my, the feelings that I have after the debate, because I don't remember the fact of the matter of every single debate I've had. For big ones, I, I can remember some. But in our debate, my, I feel like the impression that I came away with was that you either hadn't read all of the underlying tweets or you were valuing some things like, well, the FBI shouldn't be doing this a lot differently than me, than, than I was, a lot differently than, yeah, than I was, which in my mind doesn't strike as like he's lying. I don't think I've ever had that I can remember. I don't think I've ever had a conversation with you where I'm like, I think he's just 
lying about this. Now, if you would have told me, actually, Destiny, you're wrong. The FBI actually does tell Twitter to take down accounts. And I know this, and you should know this, Destiny, that they told them to take down 105,000 accounts that they had to do this. If you would have cited that, my opinion might have changed a bit because I'm like, well, hold on. They did make that like request, but it wasn't really a demand to take anything down. It was a request saying like, oh, well, look how many accounts, you know, they flagged and Twitter didn't even act on this. So if you were to start citing me specifics while omitting other specifics, then I would start to really wonder. Does that make sense? There's like but a difference. You, but yeah, no, but yeah, but then th this is where I split from like a, a decent chunk of experience in quote unquote the real world, right? Where I worked for the Marine Corps, mm -hmm. I worked for law enforcement, I got a four year degree, I worked in the private sector both as a teenager and a middle aged person. And I often realized that the things that look like it's nefarious from the outside is oftentimes either human beings trying to figure it out to the best of their ability or they're just it, dumb. Sure. Right? Hand like lens that, razor, right? Don't ascribe to malice what can e equally be um, explained by stupidity, right? Yeah. Right. But that comes with a decade of experience, right? Mm -hmm. Where, whereas, or actually probably a decade and a half at this point, where I think that some people, like not to throw Rob under the bus, but Rob as an example, or AJW as an example, they might have gotten their two year or four year degrees and then worked a single job before they became YouTubers. As a matter of fact, let me isolate it down to AJW. Uh, AJW might have, I'm not familiar with his lore, but let's say that he got his bachelor's in criminal justice. Mm -hmm. He started creating uh, law and crime-based content. He aligns with libertarians and Republicans. And then he doesn't have any of that professional experience. And then he does have a self-reinforcing mechanism of one, people who agree with him, two, audience capture, three, financial incentives. That's difficult for me to differentiate a lie between, uh, you know, motivated reasoning and a lie. So here's and just to bring this home. I, yeah, or go ahead, finish mm -hmm. your idea. Yeah. So just to bring this home with the example that you said, I will defer to uh, the FBI making these requests and Twitter as a private company saying, go fuck yourself, because as I think we both remember, Twitter actually did tell them we're not going to do that mm -hmm. for a healthy chunk of accounts. But I think somebody who's captured by motivated reasoning would could just ignore that and say, hey, uh, it's the federal government. You want to play nice with the federal government because of legislation. Therefore, they're going to comply disproportionately uh, due to perverse incentives. And that even that's like a steel man or a nuanced position. Sure. But so he, this is it's I don't know how to. Exp well, I know I can't explain this. When, when I think of somebody who's lying versus ideologically captured, an ideologically captured person and somebody that's lying, I think, act in different ways. The ideologically captured person has kind of a consistent view that doesn't require them to necessarily omit or lie about a particular thing. They just tell a certain story with some facts that are like not that great, but like it, it works. Whereas like the, the, the liar will start to hyper pick certain things and it's like, hold on, you know that this, you're not telling the full story here. So let me ground this on an example, okay? Um, yeah. Okay, um, good mutual friend, okay, Lauren Southern, all right? Do you know what her favorite two words are? Uh, no. Definitely. Mass migration, okay? Yes. If Lauren had a four year degree in econ and had studied like impacts of you know, economic impacts or whatever, of immigration across the world or some shit, and she started coming out making the same arguments she does, I would instantly assume that she's lying. Like, there's no way that you can possibly think this. This it should stand at end with everything else you've learned. There's no way that you can think this. But when she argues, she sounds, no offense, she sounds like somebody who's more ideologically captured, where it's like, okay, I can tell that you've been reading things that talk about mass migration and Muslims and whatever. And even if you're saying things that are wrong, right? Okay, I, I, it, I can hear where these things are coming from. It, come, it sounds like it's coming from a place of like ideological capture, but it doesn't sound like it's coming from a place of like somebody who's like really well studied and read in an area and is selectively quoting just the things that they know would further their own particular agenda. Um, like there, there's, but, but my, there's a different feeling, I guess, there. Yeah. Yeah. So we, now we're getting into details, I guess, sure. so that this might tangent a little bit. But I think the frustration, particularly for people who have conservative, uh, conservative leanings or libertarian leanings or whatever, mm -hmm. is that oftentimes 
uh, liberals and less lesser so progressives, but but I think like really well educated liberals, they'll be like, oh, well, you just feel the way you feel because you haven't studied it enough or you don't understand it enough or, or, or you didn't go to the right schools or you didn't get a four year degree or whatever. Mm -hmm. And in this example in particular, I think that a really well educated person could still have a massive problem with mass migration for a variety of like cultural issues and historical issues and all that kind of crap. And but I think that like a good faith version of that person who still didn't like mass migration, they would have to address the economics as well. Sure. But like, uh, I agree to show that they're like well read on the topic. Yeah. Or not even or I agree in part one billion percent with what you're saying. I agree with that one billion percent. But the way that they would like. So let's look at um, let's look at the AJW stuff and let's look at the Alvin Bragg stuff. OK. AJW could have said. I think that Bragg's prosecution of Trump, his persecution of Trump, I think that it was politically motivated. Uh, and now I'm going to make something I don't know sure, but like he was a lifelong liberal. He tweeted out negative statements about Donald Trump. And he, I think that these things shaded his perception of Trump going in. And I think that he pushed harder with these novel charges um, and the way that he extended the uh, statute of limitations by, by saying there was a commission on the ground. I don't think that if he was a, if he was a fair D, I don't think he would have done that, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Now, I would disagree with this and I would fight with this, but like, okay, fine, that's an opinion you can have. But as soon as he starts either inventing quotes or selectively quoting or or highly or like picking out certain events and highly misrepresenting them. Now I'm like, we're at a level of detail of granularity where you should know that what you're saying is just not true. So then the question is, is, is it is it just on me to point out that this isn't true? And then you'll kind of like admit this and face the facts. Or are you just hoping that I'm not aware of the underlying fact of the matter? Um, and now you auto win on this point because I can't point out that you're misrepresenting something. Like, how do you even know this? How do you even know that two prosecutors quit, but not know why they quit? Or why would you say they quit for a reason? It's like when somebody says like, don't you think 6 million is kind of a lot? And then you're like, well, what do you mean? And they're like, I don't know. I, I'm just curious about that number. It's like, well, are you, you've been saying you were curious for three years. What reading have you done on it? Oh, nothing. <laughs> well, it seems like you're not really that curious then. It seems like you're, you're just, yeah, you're being disingenuous. Yeah. That's the feeling. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, so so hold on though, because uh -huh. because this is actually really interesting from a, a content creation logistical perspective as well. Uh -huh. So, I I do the Warhammer stuff, uh -huh. and the Warhammer stuff is decently successful. Cool, but I only spend five hours a week doing that. Sure, because I check out new content that's come out, I research related lore, I write a preliminary script, I barely edit it, uh -huh. I uh, shoot the related content, and then me and my editor, we might spend 30 minutes to two hours with each other making sure that the details are fine-tuned for a product that's about to go out. So that's five hours. Uh -huh. So when it comes to a lot of YouTube creators, I think that they can be re really sloppy with their research because they're not incentivized to be like micro minutia detailed for somebody to grill them on a story. They're going on the internet in order to find a story that already aligns with their preconceived notion. I and understand. So that's where I think we're just missing huh? each other on like how micro minutia this is. Like I Googled and this was, I learned this in about 35 seconds of just reading the first paragraph and Sean even joked that when we were reading, when I was reading the quotes off to him for Alvin Bragg, he's like, oh, well, he didn't joke. He said, I think we're reading the same article. So in in all of 30 seconds, I was able to Google and debunk everything that he was saying, not just debunk it, but show that the exact opposite was true. That's mm. highly problematic for somebody who is one, and I'm gonna lean a little bit harder into him because he, I think he cites his criminal justice degree pretty extensively as like some kind of qualifying thing. And then he is a content creator that specializes in this type of commentary. So if you can be debunked on a major claim, because this is a really big claim, right? The president of the United States was politically prosecuted by an activist DA for no good reason. That's a really big claim. If your foundation for that claim is not only a lie, but the truth is the exact opposite of what you're saying, it's a really big deal. Like if you're not lying, the recklessness so, is like on the so level of the, DUI. Yeah, good. Well, no. So what, what's the difference to you between like a, a liar and a propagandist? Because I think that this perfectly illustrates like Hassan Piker. I think Hassan Piker is a, f uh, I'm, I'm trying not to swear as much in my content these days. Okay. Uh, I think he's a massive propagandist, but I think that uh, you could probably speak to this through personal experience. If you get him into a room, even when you prove him wrong on the facts, 
it doesn't matter because his overarching narrative is so politically important that if he if he loses on minutia, he will fight tooth and nail to post hoc justify his conclusion no matter what. But it's not because he doesn't believe it. He probably earnestly believes it. He's just I might maybe I'm just a little bit more jaded than you. I don't I think he knows that a lot of what he does is misinformation and, and BS. I'm especially getting that feeling now, especially when I look at how people navigate in adversarial spaces. Um, mm-hmm. people like Tim Pool, Dave Ripley, these people talk to a lot of controversial people. Look at Dave Smith. OK, after I started pushing yeah. harder on certain narratives, a lot of conservatives that don't want to talk to me at all now. Now, is it because I'm unhinged and crazy? Maybe that could be it. But when Dave Smith says that I'm not worth his time because he thinks I'm a bad faith actor and then he goes and he has debates with Vosh and then Andrew Wilson. <laughs> that's hard for me to in my head to accept that excuse. It feels more like, you know, that there's like a level of confrontation that you won't survive. Um, and I get that feeling from a lot of now, obviously now I also have a personal incentive here. How, how mm-hmm. could this, how could this not just be, he is a passionate advocate for libertarianism. He doesn't want to take a black eye in public because he knows that he's a propagandist for libertarianism. So he's going to ignore you because he knows he can, while he can spread his information unchallenged in other venues. Because, it, well, I guess it, it's questionable to me if you can market yourself as a big debater guy who's like so smart, but you're petrified of standing up against a certain opposition, unless you have a really, really, really good reason not to. And seeing him debate Andrew Wilson. The good reason is not wanting to take an L in public. Yeah, that but like, why would you? But then that, that the feeling there is that you know that if you're challenged, you're not going to be able to respond to the challenge. So do you know that you're lying or you're inadequately support? Like, that's a lie to me. That feels like a lie to me but then. There's, but, there, but there's an element here. So, mm-hmm. so for instance, th- this is actually really, it's really funny that you brought this up. I, I, was, I was doing a series called uh, Too Long Didn't Watch mm-hmm. on my little political channel. And I was going back and watching um, some of the debates. And some of your debates, actually, specifically. Uh-oh. One of them was you versus Sargon. Okay. And what was hilarious was, I remember this debate from f- four or five years ago, something like that. And my vibe at the time was that Sargon was evasive. He was cagey. You would catch him flat footed, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. Like he, he repeated himself over and over again in kind of like a, a statement that necessarily had to be true. Therefore, it, could, it couldn't change with any updated information. Mm-hmm. And so my perception five years ago was that you trounced him. Right. OK. But watching it slower and just paying attention to the words that were said, I'm not saying that Sargon did a good job, mm-hmm. but I agreed with him more. Like, I agree. Like, if you write down the perspectives, I unabashedly believe what he said more than I believe what you said. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that, like, you aren't right in your belief system. But obviously, when it comes to, like, rhetoric, you can trounce somebody in a debate and still be completely wrong on the facts of the matter. Okay. Yeah, so, so what Do you it, think what that if, um, you play? People... Did you ever play StarCraft? Yeah. Of course. The worst player can win sometimes, right? If you do like a cheese or whatever, like it's possible, right? Yeah. But you still compete to find out who the best player is. And ideally you compete to find out who the best or, or what the best ideas are, right? Isn't that kind of the point of, to, to quote Dave Rubin, who originated the concept of the marketplace of ideas? Isn't the point to see ideas like score off against one another? One, one another? Also, I understand too, I hear this complaint a lot, um, and I'm pushing back on this more, that, well, uh, this guy just engages in stronger rhetoric. Or he has stronger rhetoric. Rhetoric has always been, historically, my weakest point. Uh, my rhetoric is not. Uh, I disagree. But that's continue. fine. But like, uh, I don't do very good emotional appeals. I'm very bad at narrativizing. Uh, I usually I just like to focus on like discrete things. I'm very bad at being constructive. I tend to be destructive in arguments. I just want to tear other people's points down. In some ways, this is rhetorically strong. Like if I'm just like in like a shit in your mouth contest, I want to make the other person look worse than they can make me look bad. Um, but in terms of like overall rhetoric, like other people are usually way better at making these impassioned calls to the audience, narrativizing everything they feel, like having this constructive, positive vision of what they're advocating for. I mean, I'm usually pretty bad at those things. And whenever I hear, I hear people bring this thing out like, oh, well, in the rhetoric, you could crush somebody to debate and not be right on a single point. Everybody who says this will coincidentally be a fan of Donald Trump, who is the king of rhetoric mm-hmm. with no substance. And I was like, well, what do you actually mean when you say that? Then? Not you in particular, but what does one mean when they say, you know, does he engage in rhetoric and he doesn't actually? Well, all I do is truly is substance. That's my I, that's my strong point. Like, OK, well, let's just sit and read through this whole 
fucking case and find out who's right or wrong. Whereas the other person is usually the one that's trying to rhetorically outmaneuver me because they can't survive on the substance or the fact ground. Look at my debate with yeah. Rob. Look at my debate with Andrew. It was about, well, what is the definition of this thing? What is this? Like, okay, well, we're just we're going to play this game, I guess. Yeah. No, this this is this has been a pattern in my analysis. So uh, in in reviewing uh, not not that debate in particular, but a healthy chunk of other debates, oftentimes what will be going on is they'll be debate. You'll be debating like a, a specific current affair or a specific topic or a legal case or something like that. And what happens is you just read the case mm -hmm. and then you come and you just trounce people on information they don't know. Whereas what the a lot of people in this space, I have to say it's probably upwards of 90 percent uh, what they do is they just read news sources, oftentimes biased to their perspective already, and then they roll in with that as their prepare their preparation. Sure. So so I understand what you're I understand what you're saying. And I, I think there's merit to the fact that they might be more reliant on rhetoric. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I, I guess to finish that point. I don't think your rhetoric is weak at all. As a matter of fact, I think it appeals to the Twitch and YouTube political debate space the most. I understand what you're saying, but my I, I do a lot of reflection on how I do it debates everything. My rhetoric is easily my weakest. Um, is easily my weakest. So the thing that I've tried to improve the most over the past really like two years now. Um, what can you think of? I'm putting you on the spot. Okay, and I understand that mm -hmm. you might have an example. By the way, I say this all the time, even though people accuse me of, oh, he just demands sources. I always say, if I'm asking for an example or a source, um, I understand that you can't always provide it in the middle. I don't expect you to, right? I do say that. People still accuse me otherwise of, of not, but whatever. Can you think of a single debate that I've won on rhetoric that I just was hopelessly lost on the substance, but I was able to like rhetorically like bring it home? We might yeah. even disagree yeah, yeah, on the underlying yeah. facts. The yeah, go ahead. The, the closest thing that I can think of that was coming to my mind while we were talking, and by the way, like I, I've done like half a dozen of these, so I'm sure. not caught up on everything. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, but the the one that I actually found really funny, and I don't know how green you felt at the time, but J uh, Jim Medeker. So mm -hmm. that debate from five, six years ago, something like that, mm -hmm. I felt like he was doing a lot of uh, destinyisms, li like destiny arguments. Sure. But what was funny is he didn't have a lot of substance to back it up. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, he would be asking you for sources or papers or whatever, or like information you couldn't necessarily know. And I think at the time you weren't really ready for it. So you're like, uh, I'd have to research that. And then you would pause and like actually try to research it on the fly during the middle of the debate. So like obviously from an exterior perspective, that's look that looks like a little weak or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but then Jim would just keep on going. And then you tried to you did the Uno reverse and then he didn't have anything for you and he just laughed. Sure. Um, he just laughed it off. But but that's where I would say um, if you were saying that like your rhetoric has improved or you focused on your rhetoric for the past four or five years, I think that's a pretty good example. Well, or I'm, I'm trying to think of like where is an example where I've won the debate where you just won on rhetoric, on rhetoric but I was um, probably not. So, I probably didn't so have the Sargon, effects, Yeah. So, OK, so the Sargon argument is interesting, um, maybe because I felt like you had you might have had more substantive things, but I just fundamentally disagree with you. Um, one of the things that happened in that debate was Sargon was appealing to like nature. Can you give me a real quick, way that, what, which debate was this on? Uh, I think it was trans women or women. Okay, I was in a hotel for this one, right? I don't remember to be honest, your audio was okay. It might, so, yeah, uh, I think I had like a dark background and um, this was like, was this a four or five year ago debate? Yes. Okay, okay, it might've been on trans women, okay. Uh, okay, so, this is a harder one because like, when we the substance we both have here is just gonna is literally gonna be raw philosophy, but okay. Well, right. So so just but just as an example for where you won more optically, but I don't think you necessarily won on substance. Um, the you kind of said like, well, you keep appealing to nature, and we do hum, as humans, we do all this crazy shit. So you can't really keep appealing to nature. But that was pretty much like the sum total of your argument, mm -hmm. and I would have pushed back on that almost immediately, and I would have been like we're biological beings and there's obviously like advantages to different modes of behavior. Also a different thing that, or one thing that I kept objecting to was you kept using happiness as like the evaluation of somebody's life. Um, but then he was trying to use utility and then you kept using like happiness as a, a synonym for utility, because I think that was like, your highest value in the conversation. Okay. So yeah, I, I didn't feel like that was your, strongest uh strongest debate um, i understand what you're saying yeah i just i don't think it was the exterior perception was that you kicked ass sure hmm. i just 
Yeah, I don't. I don't feel like there's any debate I've had where I where I've won on rhetoric, but I've lost on substance. Where like I was completely lost, but I switched over to more rhetorical posturing, and I was able to win that conversation. Because usually when I usually when I know I've lost on substance, I usually lose interest in trying to win on rhetoric because it feels slimy. So like I can think of examples where like my first Middle East debate with Ryan Dawson was where I just started asking questions because I there was just no shot. I was completely outclassed in my first one, or my first debate with Nick Fuentes um, for immigration and stuff. I was completely outclassed. I just kind of resorted to like chatting. Uh, if I feel like I'm totally lost on the substance, my default, this is just like my nature. Like what I do is I tend to just like retreat into question asking mode because like, I can't, I can't argue here. But for other people that I debate, that, that almost, that never happens. Usually they immediately assume a stronger rhetorical posture. Um, my debate with, we can go through almost any debate I've done in the past year. Um, whether it's Peterson, Gorka, uh, AJW yesterday, right? Where when you're proven wrong in a fact, you kind of like tap dance your way to the next thing. Well, Braggs might not have said that, but two years later, two prosecutors quit and they said the same thing that I'm saying. Okay, well, they might not have said that, but it does go to show the bubble. And it's like, okay, you're dancing. Yeah, hardcore. That's, yeah. Um, well, that's that. That's why I kind of got pissed at uh, AJW that the time that we had a debate or conversation was because I was like, hold on, you're, you're saying that. And, and by the way, in our conversation yesterday, he changed his arguments from like two years ago. Sure. So he so during the conversation, he was basically laughing at me and calling me a moron and saying that the hashtag not all meme was my only rhetorical or that, that was my only argument. Mm -hmm. And my argument was more like, hey, no, like, you know, obviously people are materially fucked in different ways. So shouldn't we minimize the, de the degree to which people have m different circumstances and upbringing? That way we can reduce crime and then everybody has a better life. And he was like, no, that's idiotic. And so uh, what he said yesterday that was different from two years ago was he said dealing with crime is more efficient. But to me, that's just like wildly inhumane. So do we just like let human beings live in squalor in the United States of America because it's more efficient to just throw them in prison later? Sure. Like that, that's, or we that's can also we can walk and chew gum like you can do it, both. Right. Yeah. He and Well, and he said it so casually. Sure. Um, OK. Yeah. I just I push back on that. I don't like the it said a lot that Destiny has strong, like this is in response to that Dave Smith thing you brought up where, oh, well he just, he just wants to win the debate because you know, he's got stronger rhetoric and anybody can debate and scream down somebody and win on you know, these fallacies. And I agree that's possible. But the thing that frustrates me is I feel like everybody that I debate tries to do that. And I'm like one of the only people that I feel like doesn't do that. Like my Andrew Wilson debate was him trying to win purely off of rhetoric. I did a lot of reading and research in preparation for that. My debate with AJW and everything a couple, uh, two nights ago, they tried to win that purely off of rhetoric with no research or but, substance but at all. And then to... people accuse me of doing the thing that I feel like the other people are doing, where it's like, wait, really? It feels like they're the ones that are utilizing rhetoric. I have all the facts and substance. I'm doing so much reading on it. God. But, but so, so I've, I've traveled a lot. I've talked to a lot of people. I've met a lot of different kinds of people or whatever. Mm -hmm. My, my prediction is if I went to, if I hung out with Dave Smith for like, I don't know, a week yep. and we, we, we were just living his life the way that he lives his life. I don't think I would find some Machiavellian debate bro who was trying to avoid certain topics so he wouldn't get caught flat footed. What I think I would find is a pot smoking libertarian who found this philosophy during a formative time of his life. He made it his identity. Uh, he's leading a tribal group of libertarians online who all agree with his philosophy. And so he's going to post hoc rationalize every America bad, NATO evil, isolationist, fiscal conservative, libertarian policy that comes out of his mouth. But realistically, if I confront him while he's drinking or smoking weed, he's still going to believe in those things, even if I catch him flat footed. Sure, he might. So but the thing is, what you're describing is that's how people think I am. But I feel like, but you're just, it feels like you're almost saying the same thing that I am that like, yeah, they are, they all, they all do the thing that they accuse you of doing. And if you confronted them in real life, you'd probably find out, yeah, they do do the thing that they accuse you of doing. What, that you're self-deluding and you post hoc rationalize every single one of your Yeah, practices? that's what people say about my shit all the time, yeah. That's the whole point of like, oh yeah, he just debates with a lot of fallacies and blah, 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 yeah. No, I, I, th I think unfortunately, the, the closest thing that I've ever seen in the past half decade for a fallacy of yours was the uh, the Trump shooting debate, which was like obviously like a lot of what about it, what about them, quote unquote. But I also understand why you did it. Wait, what was the Trump shooting debate? You, uh, so on Pierce Morgan. Oh, okay. Where where you were saying like, 
I will denounce, you know, violence once these two people denounce X, Y, Z, A, B, C. And they kept pre they kept pressing you and they were like, well, hold on. Is it not sufficient to just say that these things are bad? And you were basically like, no, screw you. Uh, you know, what about all these bad things that these you're you're not even going to press your guests on because they're just going to cope about it? Sure. Um, and so so I understand that that was like uh it, it, it's an argument based off of principle. You're not doing a whataboutism because you think it's like a super strong rhetorical tool. You're doing it to make a point that you could apologize endlessly yeah. for the Trump, for the violence or, or the Trump attempted assassination. But trying to get Dave Rubin to shit talk uh, January 6th in a public setting is going to be pulling teeth. Yeah. But, it, but then I think you agree. You just explained all of it pretty clearly. Like none of this was like a fallacious argument or an avoidance of responsibility. No. It, it was, and and, yeah. and I, I think most people who accuse you of not having like grounded arguments or logic chains, even when I disagree with you, I oftentimes understand your logic chain. Sure. Um, I guess, did you watch my Finkelstein debate? The five and a half hour excruciatingly agonizing I, I haven't, but the clips that I saw weren't convincing me that you were uh, off. Okay. Like, like they just they, they just had Finkelstein being like... Calling me names, Mr. yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Mr. Yeah. Morcelli, you don't know anything about anything. I don't even know why you're a part of this conversation. Yeah. And that's all I saw. I didn't see him engaging with what you said and then illustrating why you were incorrect. Yeah, I agree. But the, the it's just, it bothers me that the overwhelming perception is... Like Destiny just talks fast or he tries to win rhetorically or he uses debate tactics. And it's like, I literally, for the past six months, I publish all my notes. Like you can see the notes that I take. You can come on my stream while I'm watching or reading stuff. You can run through. We can go real deep on any argument if you want to. And anytime somebody tries to even remotely go deep, they immediately retreat. Gorka tried it with the Afghanistan thing and supposedly in Trump's administration, he even had firsthand knowledge of that and he I, retreated on that. Yeah. I loved the Gorka conversation. Yeah. So it's very called, frustrating when people accuse you something that was insane. What did he call it? Had, me? It had nothing to do with the conversation. You just brought you brought something up. It, it's in the clips. It's in the first 30 seconds of the clips. And he just said, I can't even believe that you would do that. Um uh, it, it was some. You, you must have said something about the troops or the Afghanistan withdrawal or incompetence or something, something like that. Maybe sure. But, but but he he was so offended that he moral frogged about it instead of engaging with the point. Yeah, he does that. Yeah, but like it's, it's frustrating me that pe the other people that I debate seem like they do all those things, and then I get accused of doing all those things. And it's like okay, and then the, and then people are like, well, that's why Dave Smith, for instance, like wouldn't debate you. It's because he knows you do all those things. Like I don't do any of these things. Like if you want, I will sit down and have the most boring, autistic, substance substantively driven discussion like in the world. But yeah, I don't, well, so did you DM him? Did you DM him that? Did you say like, Who? I won't raise my voice, like Dave Smith, where you're like, I won't raise my voice. We will talk about the substance. I will not engage in any fallacies. You are happy to point them out when they occur. I will be the most boring, neutral debate opponent you've ever had. I don't think at this point I would cuck myself out that hard, but like we've exchanged DMs yeah. in the past about debating, but I don't know if he just happened to see more of my stuff or what happened, but uh, at some point it switched to like, no, I don't think I should waste time debating Destiny. And then he went and he debated Vosh and then yeah, I, I shouldn't. Uh, yeah, I shouldn't. I shouldn't debate a guy with like almost a million subs and a quarter million views on each video. That, yeah. That's and like, well, hold on. Yes. Also, what you just said there, and I don't even bother bringing this up anymore, but that's that to me, maybe because it's just like we're content creator brained. That's the most obvious like flaw like, I'm trying That's to cool. imagine, yeah, if there was a guy with 500,000 subs on YouTube who had, like, good monthly viewership, and he was saying some wild shit that I knew was fucking retarded, and he openly wanted to debate people, bro, I'm jumping on that dude's stream every single day. That's free clout. That's free publicity. That's easy views. It makes me look amazing. Like, yeah, but... Yeah, well, and that feels like cope, but but I think the I think the the debate sphere, what, what happens to almost everybody is it is uncomfortable being on the losing side of the debate, wh whether you felt like you were right or wrong doesn't really matter. And then it is uncomfortable to have hundreds or dozens of people calling you a fucking moron on the internet. I know that you're sick in the head, so negative publicity you find funny, uh, but for most human beings, that's actually quite stressful. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I understand what you're saying and that it can be stressful and it's... um. And it's difficult to deal with that. But I, I guess my issue is it's not the individuals that have trouble dealing with it. It's like 
it's this weird, uh, like the emperor has no clothes environment where they've created these entire self-reinforcing spaces where when I look at it from the outside, it just seems delusional. And it's like everybody's involved in reinforcing the delusion. They don't care, though. They yeah, don't but, care, but there's so many. But, but, like, then, but then my issue then to attack so you, money. to attack you, then my issue is that it feels like uh, people like you kind of like su- not support them, but like allow them, like give them a safe space to continue with the delusion. Like, I can understand why you wouldn't debate the des- sure. destiny. Like the rhetoric could be harsh. And like, yeah, he can scream you down even if you're not like 100% you know, on debating on substance, he might just win because he can steamroll you and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, geez. Yeah. Well, hold on. So, so yeah, that that's where uh, one of the clips that I got pissed off at, and by the way, I know you're not your audience, but one of the things that I got pissed mm-hmm. off at, which I took as hyperbole, was uh, neutral people are the worst. Like, I understand how you can be pissed as a debate participant that uh, somebody is being neutral when you don't think that they should be. Totally understood. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the... The, the somebody who's trying to maintain as many relationships as possible in this space so that you can create content in the future, um, I take a way different tack than you, which is probably why I've also grown substantively smaller. I almost don't attack anybody sure. uh, unless they, they come at me aggressively first. And that's so I can maintain relationships. Yeah, but so what I would say- the debate, bro. He, so here, Sorry, here's, yeah, so here, okay, so I don't disagree with your stance. This would be the suggestion I would offer that would benefit me, obviously, so take it with a grain of salt. I don't think it would hurt you though, and I think it would improve everything, okay? Is, do um, you remember, did you watch my debate with Andrew Wilson? Yes. Okay. My, well, th- hold on, hold on, hold yeah, on. Yeah, go on. ahead. I, I watched, which, which topic? The which topic? insurrection one. Uh, I, I know enough about it. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This is going to be incredibly granular. Okay. We're about to get very, very, very specific with how I'm using words here. Okay. But my debate with Andrew Wilson is that when he said he was neutral on the topic of whether or not January 6th was an insurrection, I don't believe that he was neutral on the topic because I think that neutrality on a topic implies a level of ambivalence. It implies that you've considered at least a little bit, both sides, and you've come to a neutral position. And my assessment, and then my assertion in that debate, wasn't that he was neutral on it, it's that his position was actually undefined, uh, or null, I guess you would say, right? And that was why I used that, it was kind of a joke, and I, I don't know if he actually understood it, or if any of the audience understood it, but I said, I, I asked the question, okay, if I would ask you, do you think January 6th was a hula what would your position, would you be neutral on that? You wouldn't be neutral on it. You would say, I, I can't even evaluate the question. It's nonsense, right? You wouldn't say you were neutral on something. So I feel like if your position, let's say you're saying, I want to maintain bridges. I don't want to like, you know, fight with everybody. If, if you were to say, listen, I'm a show host uh, or, or I'm, I'm a guy that doesn't invitation behind the scenes, whether this guy was bad faith, whether whatever the fuck, I'm not here to make that judgment. I invite people on, they have conversations. That's for you guys to hash out. Then I'd be like, okay, fuck it, that's fine. But when somebody says like, well, you know, I'm kind of neutral on it. I can see both positions. The considered neutral in my mind does a lot more harm to me in my position than a person who's like, I, I just, I don't engage with that evaluation. I'm not here to evaluate that at yeah, all. Yeah, but th- then this is my challenge mm-hmm. is I am both a combatant and someone who likes building bridges and relationships. And so I think I need to like verbally put my hats on for it. Because if you're, if let's say that we're a combatant, where, you know, I'm, I'm in a debate space with AJW or, or Lauren Chen or, or whoever, and, and they basically cite facts that are contrary to it, then I'm gonna take every opportunity that I possibly can in order to shit on them and at least make the audience understand that they're either, they're either lying or they're stupid or they're ill-informed, right? Mm-hmm. And so I'm gonna maximize the amount of damage that I do in that thing because I'm a combatant, not, you know, a host. Uh, when it comes to like the hosting thing, which by the way, like I'm not like a big part of hippy dippy, like Danabo, Dylan and I are just in a group chat suggesting to each other who we think would be good and then sending them DMs and getting yeses and nos, right? It's not like this big nefarious thing, right? Um, but when I'm doing the hosting thing, like I can't just go out into the world and be like, Lauren Chen is a lying snake in the grass who- Sure, you but know, you could also just not have a position on it, right? Shit. Just like, oh, I don't have a position on this. I don't, I don't make any judgments here. Yeah, but I, but I also feel like that's cowardly in a way. I, I why is it cowardly? It's it's recognizing your role in your position. No, 
I don't I like for Pierce Morgan. Uh, I don't know if they think I'm, my opinions are good or bad or if they're neutral. I they never talk about there or for any like major show that does. But I don't know like Tim Pool's bookers that Lisa Elizabeth check on Twitter or whatever. Uh, I should go check. I know that she does bookings and a couple other do. I don't know their positions on any of the people. I don't think they have is, that position. This is yeah. the dynamics. This is the dynamics of clout though. And, and I'm not trying to dog Dylan. Dylan Dylan's done an amazing thing, created amazing content, recruited all sorts of talented people. So especially the first run of Hippy Dippy, I I, I think Danabo and him knocked it out of the park. Um, second run we're working on, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but when when we're talking about the dynamics of clout, this is a huge part of the space, subconsciously or consciously. People can get away with different levels of bad behavior based off of how relevant they are to the the quote unquote like national conversation. Sure. Vosh, if he was if he was a smaller creator, he would have been fucking nuked from orbit over over the lollycon shit. Okay. Like, like absolutely annihilated. But I guarantee you that if he ever came out of the Fortress arc and wanted to start participating in it, plenty of people would hold their tongue on it just to get him in the room. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't necessarily disagree, but even at that point, I would just, I guess I would just, holding the tongue is so, uh, hmm. I was about to say, how many long-term relationships have you maintained with debate opponents? Well, it's, ha have you ever been in like an abusive situation? Of course. <laughs> like having, I just, I don't know how else to express this, but having somebody come in and both sides it is, in my mind, it is one of the most mind destroying things that could ever happen. I would rather have an abusive can person you, that I'm dealing with. Example? Like I would, like if, let's say that I'm fighting with somebody and this person has been an abusive person. I would rather have somebody come in and take that person's side and say like, yeah, fuck you, Steven, you are abusive, blah, blah, blah. Rather than what I would consider a neutral third party come in and say like, you know, I, I mean, I can see both sides of this. Like I think I, I understand both of your sides. That, that the neutral party that ha comes across as a more considered neutral, but is justifying what I would consider unjustifiable on the other side, like it destroys people's minds in ways that are, it, it's just so horrible. I, I don't know how, I don't, it's just so are, horrible. We are not talking, yeah, th this is actually one of the worst things about being a centrist or an agreeable person, is that uh, people are temperamentally liberal, progressive, left-leaning, or they're temperamentally right-leaning, and from an agreeable, centristy perspective or whatever, not only do both sides have points, but also both are necessary for society to function. And so the role of the agreeable person, however unpopular it is, is to try to reach some kind of like syn synthesis between these parties who otherwise would be at total war with each other. Yeah, but the issue so, is, I just had a debate with P.F. Chung over this last night, that synthesis yeah. always, there's two huge fallacies or flaws with this assumed synthesis. One is that the correct decision is always somewhere precisely or narrowly in the middle between two considered sides or two opposite or opposing sides. And that two, every opposing side has like equal or deserves equal consideration. But like I can imagine that like can you can you give me an example where the solution is not somewhere in the middle something that's like obviously morally slanting in a direction that you believe is just fundamentally sure. correct? Sure. Two people are having an argument, and one guy is saying um, there's a teacher, and he's saying, "Listen, this student seduced me. You know, they wanted to fuck me. I probably should have said no, but fuck it, I couldn't help it. She gave me the fuck me eyes, and I ended up fucking my student." And another guy saying like, I, "There's no way that you should have fucked the student," and the student is 11 years old. Uh -huh. Is this something where you would come in and say, I mean, I can see the arguments. She was wearing a lot of like crazy pink bows <laughs> and like. You had to go for the pedo, the pedo. Uh, sure. But like, it, I mean, like, either, yeah. I mean, there is some, I mean, maybe she no, was really no, seductive. I mean, like, well, I don't know. Well, this is, no, this is, this is, uh, I don't want to say it's like a misunderstanding of centrism because obviously plenty of centrists do this. Uh, but I, I think that what an actual critical thinker would do would realize that there is a correct answer to this problem based off of a variety of considered perspectives and that no matter what that you know like the nambla or the map or the propedo or, or the sneeko argumentation is just going to be incorrect Sure, right. but then, let, but let, then let. I would say the same would be true about like there was there is no neutral position on Sean's claims about Alvin Bragg's one was a lie and the other was what he actually Ooh. said. There isn't a considered neutral there. He just lied. He's completely wrong. And you would side against him the same way you side against a teacher fucking an 11-year-old right. student. So, so in, the, in this conversation, though, in order to do that, because I view not necessarily like there's some things that we disagree with, whatever. But 
in order to make an evaluative claim on what's going on, I, I, as somebody who's articulating my position in public, I have to do the research first, right? So I have to read what Alvin Bragg said. I have to see a clip of what uh, AJW said. I have to see what his reaction to being corrected. And then I can be like, okay, this guy, and then this guy's being disingenuous. Yeah, but you're making, public. now you're making arguments for you having the unconsidered position. Just say like, oh, like I, I don't have sure. a stance on this at all, rather than the considered neutral, where I'm neutral on this. I don't know, it could be, couldn't be. Yeah, so I would I would say that uh, if this is getting back to the BPF, the Andrew Wilson debate or whatever, um, I agree that his his uh, position was unconsidered, not considered. And then I also agree that even if I articulated poorly yesterday, I was trying to say in reference to whether or not AJW is a liar, I have an unconsidered position in reference to that. Okay, I didn't feel that way. I feel like if I go back and I watch it, I'm not sure 100% if that would be the impression I would get, but I don't think there's anything wrong with an well, unconsidered neutral. So going back well, to the abuse example, if somebody's like, hey, do you think she was abusive to me? And the guy's like, I don't know any of the details, bro. I couldn't tell you, I'm sorry. As opposed to like, uh, I can kind of see both sides of it. Even though these are both in, in common parlance, people might say both people have a neutral position. The considered neutral is a lot different than the unconsidered neutral. Well, the guy just doesn't have a well, Okay, so, mm -hmm. so hold on. This is, this is a frustration of mine though. Uh, specifically, I, I can use an example from the conversation yesterday okay so the or the debate friday i guess mm -hmm. so pisco has a talent for being self-righteously offended absolutely by other people's positions <laughs> yeah he, he, he can just, he loves to be offended by somebody's position and act like they're a total moron okay and what i think was interesting about ajw seeing like hey i actually need to think about the civil war example the the reason why i kind of reflexively get pissed off at pisco is because there's an interesting conversation there, right? Like, what's the democracy of the states versus the democracy of the federal body of the United States? What did the Articles of Confederation versus the Bill of Rights look like? What was all the legislation through the early 19th century look like where states thought that they could secede? Sure, and then but you well, actually come to an argument that like the uh, the secessionist states were protecting their internal democracy. I understand. I understand what you're saying. I understand uh -huh. what you're saying here, but contextually, the answer is mm. wild because it shows a horrendously bad, fo bad faith approach to what the debate actually was. So, for instance, okay. let's say this is one of the reasons why I I hate the. Um, do you know the Fabian Scott guy? Yes, of course. This is one of the reasons I don't like him on any panel I've ever been on. Okay, let's say that you get into a debate with somebody, and the debate is. Um, did O.J. Simpson murder, was it Nicole? I don't even know, right? Yeah, yeah, Okay, did O.J. Simpson like, murder Nicole, okay? And let's say that you start to have this debate and you know, the other guy is like, well, you know, like they, you know, they didn't prove it, the, the glove didn't fit, you know, I, they, they, there were all these other facts that don't line up. Right. And let's say at some point you're like, hold on, okay, Jesus, hold the fuck on, wait a second. Do you think that, um, do you think that, uh, um, oh, fuck, give me one famous murder in history. Who murdered somebody? I mean, O.J. Simpson, obviously. No. Uh, John Lennon? Okay. Do you think that John Lennon okay? was murdered? Well, let's not do that one. Do you think John Lennon was murdered? Okay, let's say you asked me. I was like, do you think John Lennon was murdered? Do you think, I don't know, was that guy ever convicted? Did they find him? Yes. It? Okay, yeah. Do you think John Lennon was murdered? Then let's say that their answer was, well, that's a really good question. John Lennon, when he was killed, is in the United States of America, I think that murder is a legal judgment, and I'm, an, I'm a libertarian, and I don't know if I'm comfortable with the state being able to make that determination. So it's a really, the, as soon as they answer that question, the issue isn't, uh, the issue isn't that like, they're taking a libertarian approach to the concept of what a murder, that, that's not the issue. The issue is like, hold on, why the fuck are we debating whether or not O.J. Simpson was murdered or not if you don't even believe in the legal concept of murder, right? I personally, right. I would never have a debate with somebody about if democracy was on the ballot if they can't quickly and concisely think that the Civil War was a threat to American democracy. Because what that tells me is I have to prove <laughs> that just voting for Donald Trump is, an, is a greater existential threat than an actual having occurred civil war. I could never meet that burden. That I, would, well, I just wouldn't on. even this have is, the debate. I'd be, yeah. Partially, yeah, this is where I feel partially responsible, though. So I'm not saying that Sean is acting necessarily in good faith or whatever uh, for the the thing but i also think that sean probably does have some level of autism and so if i look at lauren i said hey do you want to debate whether or not trump is gonna and i would have to look at the exact tax but i basically say like is democracy at threat in the upcoming election and lauren's like uh maybe i would do it i don't know i would want sean there you know he's a good debater um you know what's the exact prompt right 
And so I sent her the exact prompt and then she's like, okay, I'm good to go, you know, set it up. As long as, long as Sean's willing to do it, set it up. With Sean though, what happens is I sent him the more hyperbolic version, right? I, I said, you know, is, is Trump gonna end democracy if he's elected? Sure. And so that's the more hyperbolic version that of course is supposed to be titillating so I can recruit people for the panel. And then he didn't ask and I didn't say. Sure, so but I even Laura, I don't think he, I would be shocked, and maybe she would, because we've just heard a lot of things. I would be shocked if I asked if I asked Lauren Southern, do you think the Civil War was a threat to you? I don't think she'd be like, well, that's a really good question. Was it a threat? I'm not actually sure. <laughs> or if I were to ask Lauren Southern, if Trump ended democracy for four years and then we managed to have a revolution and bring it back, would you say that was a threat to democracy? I don't think Lauren would go, no, I guess not, because it came back in four years. Those are exceptionally stupid answers. That sure, but Sean I also gave. feel ill-equipped. I feel ill-equipped Ill to condemn because I caught the second hour of the debate and not the first. Sure, right? but you don't have to condemn. No, just so don't. But I don't even don't take it considered neutral. I just be like, oh, I don't have a position. Whatever. That's it. Rather than saying like, well, sure. you know, yeah, yes, also, it was a good question, and maybe you could consider. It, I, but I also want to extend as much good faith as possible because I'm the one who technically fucked it up. Right. I don't agree with that. Say, you didn't. You didn't fuck it up, but. Uh, well, okay, and I was about to say, you can disagree with that, but I, I bear some level of culpability because here, here's the thing. Even if Sean um, was moving to or was moving to a different frame, right? Like after the initial, I don't know, 30 minutes of the debate where we're squabbling over definitions or whatever, he might have thought, he might have seen Trump is going to end democracy in 2024 and then uh, basically been like, oh, this is, this is an easy dub, easy win barely have to research it. I can show up and I can trounce anybody on this shit. And so that's where, for me, that's, that's if he thought that at any point, that's partially my fuck up. Well, but like, now, no, okay, not to, not to toot my own home. No, hold on, not to toot my own yeah. horn, okay, but if I've earned anything in fucking eight years, I would say that I command some level of respect, okay, as a debater in the space, I would hope, would I, would a reasonable person really think that Stephen is coming to this debate to argue that Donald Trump is going to be elected and democracy permanently and forever, and that he could justify that in a debate. That's a that's a really ambitious prompt, even from me. <laughs> like the, per the permanently and forever thing is where I'm start to. That's where I'm like, that's not me. That's you, right? Because because I you can, for instance, with the Civil War thing, which I think is obvious, but apparently it's not obvious, is the Civil War didn't end democracy in the United States if you consider the federal gov government, the, the continuity of the federal government of the United States, the level to which democracy would be ended, right? But if you consider democracy for the slaves or the Confederacy to become more totalitarian under their own uh, power, then obviously it was an existential threat to the United States that would have ended democracy for tons of people. Sure, so, but like even so even even at the even at the end yesterday, you can't, mm -hmm. even even yesterday in the conversation, we asked Sean doesn't even think the United States is a democracy, so it's like what does he even have a position yeah, on I, anything? I like what, it's but yeah, I don't I think I think that it's autism if it manifests in all areas, but when it's selective autism, it's just bad faith. Right. Like if somebody were to say, like, how can you be that autistic about is it a threat to democracy? And then say, well, the DNC absolutely committed a coup when they replaced Biden with sure. Kamala. You can't have both those sure, positions. Sure. That's an autism. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This this brings me back to um, a point that I want to make. And then honestly, I probably have to go do something else because okay. uh, I'm, I'm working on some side projects. That's good. But the um, the the thing about it is, though, the, the more that I participated in this space, I thought that I was going to come in and I was going to have such novel and interesting and intelligent and well-articulated and concise mm -hmm. points that I was just going to build a cult of personality, create an ideology and, you know, become a multimillionaire. Right. That, that, that was the dream when I first started. OK. Uh, what I've realized, though, by looking at a lot of creators is that they didn't come in with some novel ideology. They oftentimes find an ideology that they already largely agree with, and then they just say what that tribe wants to hear. And then they ride the crest of energy of that political tribe into relevance. But the second that they try to break out of their little box of political tribalism, oftentimes they take massive shit from their audience, they lose money, and they lose relevance. Um, so, so my point is that these people, I 
borderline don't view them as personalities anymore capable of like autonomy sure just as a quick thing as like what you're saying uh, also applies to the entire media sphere not just alternative media you, you might already know that but yeah but go ahead but but yeah but th basically i don't view them as people capable of individual conscience anymore um i almost view them as like tribal leaders sure but then also if you just said that i'd be fine with that like if you came in yesterday while people were talking to Sean, you're like listen <laughs> I don't think Sean is capable of generating independent thought because he's so heavily audience captured. But like, oh, okay, fine. That's fine. I buy that. Okay, sure. That's my position. Yeah. Uh, sure. Uh, I, I think, but but I still stand by what I said yesterday, which uh, which I'm I'm kind of drawing a blank on right now. Which is, uh, I think that there's con there's considerations when you're somebody who's trying to recruit people for future debates and shows. Uh, you know, you'll look past that shit. And then also when it comes to like a liar, like you, you have to evaluate a, a pattern of behavior because there are self deluded tribal leaders. Um, so, for instance, um, let, let's say that I'm not saying Nick Fuentes is gay, mm -hmm. but let's say that he had homosexual impulses. OK, is is there a world in which he is so captured by Christian nationalism that he cannot bring himself to acknowledge his homosexual impulses? Because he's That's literally self delusional. True, yeah, for sure. People do that. This, there's examples in the real world of this of like gay conservatives that don't want to come out because they're worried about yeah how they'd be received and everything, right? But that dad right. in American Beauty. Sorry, I just wanted to make one quick appeal uh, on behalf of all the autistic people watching, which is probably most of them. Fuck. Uh, yep. Don't call it autism. Okay? Yeah. It's not autism. What they do is, what Republicans and conservatives do is, and I've noticed this from like three conversations with them, is they're not being autistic. They are being um, a fucking idiot's stereotype of an autistic person. Yeah. Okay. Autistic people don't struggle with fucking subtext. Okay. They pretend, <laughs> people like this pretend to when it suits them. And then suddenly they are very, very aware of subtext as soon as it's happening in their direction. Yeah. Case in point, uh, Kelly it's, your Jean. Fault, uh, it's your fault that oh, Trump sorry. got assassinated, uh, had someone tried to kill him because you keep comparing him to Hitler. Well, but also everything we said about the election was not incitement to violence or to an insurrection. Uh, yeah. This is what I was pointing at before sure. with like the selective Do you have a better word. Well, it, the, it's not autism. It's bad faith or maliciousness, it's right? Obtuse. Yeah, yeah. Selective autism? No, it's not. Well, but it's, it's not even selective. It's like it's intentionally obtuse. Yeah. It's acting. Well, I, 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 I used obtuse yesterday and uh, Destiny didn't feel like that carried enough intention. Well, because, well, you just said it didn't carry enough intention. Lonerbox used the phrase intentionally obtuse, not just obtuse. Obtuse oh, shit, is like somebody shit. that misses the point. You're being obtuse. Well, no, obtuse carries with it a slight connotation of intentionality, but it's still not harsh enough for what's happening. A person's not just being mm. obtuse by missing the point. They, it is intentional. It is bad faith. Like sure. Sean knows that what he's saying is incorrect and he's trying to, to tilt it in the best possible way that he can to represent an argument that he knows is unjustifiable. That's bad faith. That's nothing about that is autistic. Nothing about that is... <laughs> This is another point, though, is that I live in a republic, uh, regardless of whether or not I want to. And I have to deal with liberals, progressives, Republicans, conservatives, et cetera, et cetera. And somehow I have to get all of you to not kill each other. Right. And so as much as you can hate these tribal leaders and think that they're bad faith or obtuse or uh, selective, well, you're, I don't disagree with you. But it would just go back to that thing. Just don't have a neutral position. Just have like a, just don't have a position. Don't take a position on it. I just invite people to the show. That's all you have to do. Just say that. Don't take the responsibility or the blame for them not being able to read a prompt that every other person understood. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll think about that. I, I just, I, I think it's hard for me because I, I wear like three or four hats and I also have like aspiration, aspirations as well. Sure. So, so trying, try, being like conscious of what hat you're wearing and trying to calculate exactly how you should phrase something. And by the way, like whenever, whenever I'm talking at all, I'm telling you exactly what's in my brain. That's probably why I'm so long winded. OK, um, so, so. So, yeah, so remembering which hat I'm wearing and then saying the exact right thing to get the result is not typically my approach. My approach is this is in my brain. It's coming out. Sure, that's fine. But then you have to accept then that if that's your MO, if that's how you're going to operate, well, then obviously I'm going to come out swinging really hard against that because I feel like you're undermining what I think should be an easily observable fact. And our our um, incentives are not aligned there, right? Sure. No, no, 100%. And there, there's a part of me that it, that um, enjoys the, the combat as well. 
I, I think the reason, the, the main point, the, I was steaming a little bit yesterday. Um, I think the main thing that I, that I was fussy about is you just have, like Dan, right? He talks shit about how I'm long-winded. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that yesterday in the conversation. Um, I can think back to a dozen creators who I think are retarded, uh, half of whom now are like out pedophiles, like, you know, Zerka. Um, we call and, them ephibophiles, actually, but yeah, ephibophiles. So, so there's probably like two or three ephibophiles in your past who are fucking morons. But because they're entertaining morons, I could probably go back and find like forty hours worth of content with them just talking about nothing. You know what I'm saying? So that that's why when I that's why I get pissed when people are like, "Shut the fuck up, make the point already." I'm like, "What, well, bitch? You listen to fucking John Zerka talk for twelve fucking hours? Shut you, shut the fuck up." So. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, um, what did you want, Boner Box? Oh, I just came in to chime in on the autistic thing, and then I felt rude just leaving without oh. saying bye. Way to go. <laughs> okay. I got to run downstairs right, well, and grab a thing from the package room. If you guys want to talk or if you want to rant to my audience, knock yourself out. Otherwise, I'll be back in a sec, or you can leave or whatever you want. I'll be back. Okay, yeah, I'll talk to I, you for a second, Connor. Give me a second. Wait, were you leaving? Sure. No, oh. no, no. I can I can talk for a second. I I, uh, I did want to leave in the next like five to ten minutes, though, because I need to work on a 3D print and go hang out with the family. Oh, that's fine. I just need to workshop you. Um, I need to know what uh, important things about the UK riots you think an American uh, centrist or like right leaning person would want to know. Sure. Um, are they race, race related? Are they religion related? Uh, who are the tribal factions that are involved? What motivates them? Has anybody died? Uh, and also what was like the, so if I, if I had to guess, it was like racist soccer hooligans against Muslims, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so did the Muslims do anything crazy? Because there was obviously like a, a few videos of like Muslim dudes beating the shit out of a few white people and also walking around with machetes. Um, did anybody actually die or were those just like shows of force that didn't result in anything? Um, I don't know how many videos that, okay, that's cool. Um, the, the, one video I saw of a bunch of people running around with knives and blades was actually a wedding because it's like in Yemen they do those weddings with the scimitars <laughs> and it was like two <laughs> nice. Um, uh, okay. Uh, so have you, were you just kind of like, were, did you read about this or did you watch stuff about it or did you just kind of absorb stuff from the general conversation? Uh, no, I actually, around? I talked about it a little bit. Uh, my, my understanding was it was a schizophrenic Rwandan gentleman who stabbed like three Swifty girls between the ages of eight and 11. And then it went out that it was a Muslim person. And then a bunch of soccer hooligans started beating the shit out of Asian people in the street. Uh, that mm -hmm. was my, oh, and then also firebombing hotels, which I thought was insane. Yeah. Did, did you get any understanding of why they were doing that? Uh, my understanding was massive anti-immigrant sentiment. Okay. Am I wrong? Uh, no, I just wondered if it was more detailed than that. Like people being upset that they're allowing asylum seekers to stay in hotels or people saying that they're all illegals or people saying that there are a bunch of terrorists in there and shit, but none of that. Well, yes to all of the above, because I, I think right. the, the thing that people are, were pissed about and something that's brought up in American politics as well is I think that New York City has a sanctuary policy. I, I forget what they call it, but it's like a no, no homeless thing where basically if, if there's hotels that have empty beds in the city, they have to accommodate people. And so as a result, some immigrants and asylees and all that kind of stuff are getting state subsidized hotel rooms. And Wait, so, so they, get, they get they get put in the hotel room and then they just get like the whilst other guests are just staying there normally. Uh, I to be honest, I'd have to research the program. But the but the point being that, like, this is obviously co coming at significant taxpayer expense because mm -hmm. I think the hotel people complained. And so as a result, they are getting paid. Right. Uh, so I, I imagine there's something in the UK that's similar where asylees and immigrants are getting substantial amounts of uh, subsidization for their living costs. Okay. Um, do you have any idea? Did you get any impression of why they were getting put into hotels? No. Not just regular old centers. Okay. Um, Probably because the centers are full? Yeah, there was a big backlog because the Conservative Party was wasting a whole bunch of money on trying to send them to Rwanda, and it failed, obviously, because it was very illegal. <laughs> Um, well, but, but from my perspective, this actually kind of cuts to the core of the argument, though. Like, why... Uh, why do people have a right, almost a borderline and unfettered right to 
emigrate. It's not to emigrate, it's to claim asylum. But is that what you mean? I, I guess, but you know, looking at the numbers in the United States, I know Europe and the United States aren't the same, but we we if I remember the numbers correctly, out of like a hundred people who apply for asylum, four are granted. So that, uh, that means I like don't know what it is in the United States people are getting kicked back. On the UK, it's um, it's like sixty to seventy percent of them get accepted. So I don't know what happens in the United States. I remember I, I seem to remember seeing a one in hundred stat before that was complete bullshit, but I forgot. But that was to do with interviews. well, the the one that um, I looked at, I think was from the state, so I'm not. I don't think it's total bullshit. Yeah. Um, but basically, it was it was specifically asylees, and it was people applying from uh, South and Central America. And so like that, the highest one, I think, was a, a country that was in an active civil war. It was like Nicaragua. They bumped up to like 20 or 30 percent acceptance. But then all the other ones like Belize and uh, countries that might be poor but are not at war. It was insanely low percentages. Uh, I don't know. I don't know about the United States. Um, yeah. So but, but, the, but the point is, like, is there do, do you think that there's like a moral right to immigrate? Uh, to have, well, to claim asylum, I, I don't know how else you would do it because the only way to find out if someone's gotten a legitimate asylum claim is if they turn up and get processed. So I don't really know. But if you're getting a situation where like only 5% of asylum claims are getting uh, accepted, then I'd imagine what you would do is, I don't know if you do this in America, but you would have like a, like a pre-vetting system where you kind of go through like a quick check to make sure that it's not just some really obvious thing. Like they just came from fucking like a middle-class lifestyle to have a slightly better life in a different country. But I don't know. Well, that, like I think that we have a natural deterrent in the UK because claim asylum in the UK fucking sucks. <laughs> yeah. um, like you get fuck all money. you spend like maybe up to a year or more trying to uh, wait for your claim to get processed. I think they give you like seven pounds a day for food, clothing, and uh, toiletries. So mm -hmm. that's the deterrent. So, so, why, so why why, am I hearing from right-wing Brit bongers that, uh, you know, Keir Starmer or whatever and the conservatives were all gung-ho on keeping everyone out, but then as soon as, uh, you know, the Keir Starmer took position, like just boats of immigrants just flooded the... Uh, neither of those Blood things happened. So the small boat crossings were large before Keir took power. Uh, he was never saying mm -hmm. keep them out. Keir said we're going to reduce uh, legal migration because it's been at unprecedented heights for the last two years, uh, twice mm -hmm. as high as we're used to for net migration for the last couple of years, uh, partly because of Ukrainians, partly Brexit. Uh, but no, his policy was always, we're not going to send them to Rwanda for processing. We're going to process them here. But what we will do is we'll go after smuggling gangs. So we'll try to stop smuggling gangs. But if someone crosses with a boat, uh, we we let them claim asylum and we let them claim it here. That's Keir Starmer's policy. He never went back um, on anything so far. Okay. And correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, oftentimes, like 2020 was the the year that was cited as like, oh, this is untenable. And it was like 500,000 or 700,000. But wasn't like yeah, 20 yeah. or 30% of that Ukrainians? Uh, yes, a third was Ukrainians for one or two. Yes, there were two years where we had between six and 700,000 people net migration. And yeah, about a third of them were Ukrainians in one year. Yeah, so, I mean, those people what are white used Christians. To is, They're good, right? Yeah. What we're used to is two to 300,000. Yeah. But that's like legal migration. Yeah. So, for, how, so, so how do you, how do you feel? I, I know that you're not, you know, despite appearing white, you're not, uh, uh what, what, you're Syrian? Lebanese. Lebanese. I was close. Um, so you're Who cares about that, right? Connor? Connor, Connor, you're not voting for Kamala Harris? Uh, <laughs> no, what's wrong with you? This man is an official part of the platform. Are you probably serious, not. dude? Wait, wait. Are, are yeah, you go talk to your fucking boss and get them to take that cringe shit off the platform. What are you talking about? So, number one, you acknowledge that it would be preferable to have Kamala Harris as president than Donald Trump, correct? Probably, yeah. Probably. Why are you being a little weasel all of a sudden? I thought that you were part of democracy. Why am I being a weasel part... all of a sudden? Yeah. I'll why are you being a weasel? I'll tell you why. Because this is like a this is like a vegetarian voting against vegetarianism. That's why. It's like what are a, you? It's like an abortion <laughs> person. It, it's like it's like a person who's like very pro choice, having to vote pro life for for the sake of. Uh, it's a very the, simple question. Election. Do you acknowledge Kamala Harris is the better option vis a vis Donald Trump? Sure. Okay, then why wouldn't you vote for the better option? Because if I, in any way, contributed to an assault weapons ban, I would eat my own gun. What about if you, in any way, contributed to the election of Donald Trump? Then I, I can't say that because of terms of service.
Well, here's the thing. If you're saying, <laughs> you're essentially saying that you care more about the Second Amendment than Donald Trump ending democracy. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, because, because here's the thing. I actually, I would have gone to the debate yesterday and I felt like I could have been a pretty passionate uh, right-wing argumentative side because I think that while Donald Trump poses a threat to democracy, I think our republic is strong enough to survive a second presidency. Uh, what do you think is more important, the right to vote or the right to bear arms? Ah, uh, the right to bear arms, like like by a million percent. Holy shit! That's yeah. What is wrong with you? <laughs> what's wrong with me? I know where power comes from. That's where. That's what's wrong with me. Well, from so you think it's civilians <laughs> with guns? It it comes from any gun. From fucking yeah. Cleus with his uh, fucking pickup truck and his little fucking Glock. I don't know that's if I'm right. saying any of these words properly. Yes. I don't know yeah, if that, that, that's that that's correct. Force the the ability to implement your agenda is power. Hundred percent. In the in the more d diffused power is, oftentimes the better people are. So you're like a fascist. You'd rather live in a fascist dictatorship where you have your gun rights as opposed to a democracy where like maybe you could vote to have guns or vote not to have guns. Uh yeah. Yeah. That's right. But it sounded like you made a democracy argument for that because you're talking about power, right? Like the guns are to do with power. So like you lose your protection against tyranny. Is that like the problem? Or yeah, that's it. Like like the the biggest irony of this entire thing. Like I know Pisco loves to come and he didn't get me all riled up. He has like a very <laughs> talent for it. Uh, but the well, hey, you but, 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 you hold, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Because, because this is the this is the silliest shit in the world. So, so, so Trump is an existential threat to democracy. Yeah. Um, okay. He, he's on the verge of at minimum fucking over brown and black people to a degree unprecedented in history. I don't know and why you're going also, there, but okay. And, and he also hates the transes. Is that, mm -hmm. is that approximately true? Um, I wouldn't put it in those terms. I don't know. My, my, my complaints have never been kind of identity based. I do think that he's a risk to trans uh, gender people. Yes. And I do think that he's racist, but I don't, I don't know that that's why I'm worried about him. Why are you worried about him? I'm worried about him because he tried to overthrow the last election and thereby end democracy in America. And he, there's a risk that he could do similar things in the future. Okay. Uh, and you seem to acknowledge that too, <clears throat> and and you actually like bit the dumber bullet. You were like, "Yes, I'd rather live in an authoritarian dictatorship with guns than in a democracy where like people yeah, cho you, chose you to know vote." Why? Be because in in the case of fire, uh, you have a fire extinguisher. In the case of a tyranny, you have firearms. So being like, "Hey, Connor, do you want to get rid of the fire? Do you want to get rid of your fire extinguisher while there's a fire?" The answer is no. And it's like, do you want to live in a house without fire extinguishers? The answer is also no. So the, you, you literally would rather live in dictatorship of America than like in the United Kingdom or Australia? Well, I, yes. Oh, yeah. hundred percent all day. The, the, problem with it, the problem with tyranny I mean, is that if someone rises to tyranny, they probably have followers and those followers also have guns, right? Like it's, it's not yeah. just you and the fucking uh, rice banner and the KPD. Right, fighting, so hold on, like, so hold on. So if we want to if we, <laughs> we take this, like, if we want to take this out of the realm, it, let, let, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it in context for what's actually going on in society. Okay. MAGA is 15% of the population, maybe 20% of the population, even in a dictatorship run by MAGA, where uh, Donald Trump somehow convinces the population to go along with him having unlimited terms, which I don't think is possible. Um, yeah, you you want firearms in that scenario. Connor, you're, you're going down the harder the path. Con Connor, that? you're going down the harder path. You've already bit the bullet on the stronger version of this. So we don't need to get into reality. You just said, I would rather live in a dictatorship where I get to keep my guns than in the United Kingdom. And, and the presumption being, of course, that there would be resistance to the fascist government, right? Yeah, but the resistance is going to be like <sighs> you and Antifa, like who the fuck versus what the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers and shit like that, bro. Like, my, in terms of a fucking armed struggle for power, like MAGA's got you guys, Jesus. Well, so go, I, go I think there's Trump, plenty. Wait, why aren't hold you on, going for Trump? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Shut up, shut up. Um, I think that a healthy chunk of Republicans are constitutionalists. 
And I think that constitutional Republicans and uh, I'm trying to think of another group and libertarians would not be, you know, they, they, they wouldn't be friendly to a Trump dictatorship. Every American libertarian I've ever met would love a Trump dictatorship. But I think well, who the fuck are these libertarians? AKA, <laughs> I, you I, 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 AKA, AKA like you principled or philosophical or, or are you talking about like Twitter ones? Because because I don't think Bruh. there's like a single I don't think there's like a the single same. principled libertarian that would be like, Oh yeah, I love dictatorship. It's my favorite. Well, you just said that you care more about guns than voting, that you'd rather live yeah. in a dictatorship with guns than the United Kingdom. Um and I just have to like like what you should vote for Trump then. Why don't you vote for Trump? Uh, because he tried to suspend the Constitution. And I'm a constitutionalist. But the Constitution also includes like rights to have republics and not dictatorships. So why, do you, why are you valuing the Second Amendment, your version of the Second Amendment, over like all the other important bits of the Constitution, namely like the republic of it? Because I think, because I think it's foundational. Gun rights? Yeah. So, like, we, you know we have, like, an automatic weapon ban in the United States? Yep. I mean, I, I think, it, I think even, <laughs> I think, here, here, I'll go further, Pisco. I think that you could pass an assault weapons ban, and civilians could be, pa could, they could be limited to bolt-action rifles, lever-action rifles, and revolvers, and they could still destroy the federal government. But that doesn't, that's not getting to like the heart of the criticism here. And, and just so you're aware, the text of the oh, Second Amendment says, I, I'll get there. It says, a well regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. You just want to bypass that. And then it talks about the right to bear arms. You want to bypass oh, that and just get oh, rid of the free on, state. Be before you move you just want to get rid can, of the free state. Can you read the state. second half? Can you read the, the second right half? The right of the people to, to keep and bear arms right shall not who? be infringed. The right of the, the people right to who? keep and bear arms. The right of the people to keep and bear right, arms. I'm, listen, I'm not arguing. I'm not arguing that the Second Amendment isn't an individual right. I'm not arguing that right now. Okay. Okay. What I mean is, just wanted to make sure that clear to the, the audience. The purpose, the purpose of the Second Amendment is to have the security of a free state. You just want to get rid of the free state. No, I don't. I well, very just, much want the free state. Sorry, given the choice between a free state and a gunless state, you would get rid of the the free state if it meant keep keeping your guns. Uh, hold on. Can you literally just read the amendment again? A well-regulated militia be necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep oh. and bear arms shall not be infringed. So, so you want to eliminate the well-regulated militia? I don't want to get rid of. I don't want to get rid of. I don't want to get rid of the well-regulated militia. I'm not saying that we should ban all guns, but what I am saying uh, is, hey, we already banned some guns, and it's not like our freedom has gone away. Don't you have to make? Uh, Whoa! Yeah. So you think our automatic weapons ban, like that, was just as bad, or I'm sorry, that that was incompatible with American republicanism? That ban? No, I don't. No, I don't. I'm not. I'm not Why wouldn't an assault weapons ban be incompatible with American republicanism? It's not. I, I I already said that you could probably still fulfill the requirement of the Second Amendment with 19th century technology. I just think that. Then why aren't you going to vote for Kamala? Is, is Destiny back? I was trying to entertain the. I was trying to entertain the audience. I don't know is, if he's back, but, but why wouldn't you just vote for Kamala then? If it, if you don't, if all it would take is to have like older weaponry to fulfill the requirement of it, why aren't you because, voting for her? Okay, so so let's say let let's. Uh, I'm going to run it back. Allow me to narrativeize it. Let's say that the it was opposed, right? Uh, Hillary Clinton was an existential threat to the United States of America. So Democrats had to vote for Trump. Right. And Trump said that he was going to leave abortion alone. But you are in an avid pro-choice person. And you know that Trump has people in his cabinet who are going to go after abortion. Would in 2016, are you mm -hmm. going to take the risk to pull the lever, not to be neutral, not to not show up for your party, but to actively vote for the opposing party, knowing that you will bear some level of culpability if, God forbid, he appoints a bunch of justices who then repeal Roe versus Wade. Are you pulling that lever? Yeah, so I'm going to answer your question just to make sure I understand it. It's like if there was an existential threat to like the structure, but the person who was the opposition to the existential threat Let's promised like to go after. Let's potential existential, but yes. 
Okay, sure. The person who was in opposition to that was like um, promising to go after a right I very much cared about. Fair? Yes. Y- yeah, I'm like a consequentialist in that regard. If I think that the president is going to, you know, do a, some bad things, if it's a choice between some bad things and like the worst possible thing, I'm going to go for the quote unquote lesser evil. And I think that you would too. And you started this conversation by saying, I actually think Kamala Harris is the lesser evil, or I. I probably think that she's a lesser evil. And so why wouldn't you just vote for her? Be, because th- this kind of gets into like the, the Fabian Liberty thing. We were talking about him earlier tonight. Uh, th- there's some there's some principles that you just can't violate. A- and and this is one of mine. Like you, you can call me a freak for it if you want. But I think I don't think that this is a fun right to have. I don't think it's a a quirk of American culture. I don't think it's just something cute from our, uh, you know, something quaint and cute from our past. I view it as culturally foundational. Okay. I guess democracy is as well, though, right? No, it's not. Uh, okay. d- democracy in, is in America. Oh, guns are more popular. Okay. No, as, as a matter of fact, what you know. So what's what's interesting is there. There's a lot of things that I would revert to, like a 19th century understanding. Now, I'm not saying that I wouldn't like. Uh, so, so for instance, like we we have a democracy, quote unquote, in the United States, right? Like a republic, right? Yeah. Um, but the republic started out exclusively for white landowning men. Yeah, you would right? you would go back to that as well. <laughs> so the guns are to no, protect you from tyranny, no. but it's no. not tyranny in place Hold of democracy. On. Early, right? Like it's okay, okay. Go. I'm just saying what I'm you sa- got up. I'm not a Saturday morning cartoon villain. Jesus okay. Christ. So no, I I obviously wouldn't go back to a race based metric for voting, um, but I would go to a meritocratic or competence based uh, metric for voting You're all day every day. Uh, be- because I want I want competency in the voting public. You you want like like poll tests you want like yeah i want i want a competency test to be able to vote 100 percent. like you don't want poor people to vote maybe not landowner you're like jd vance if if he is in favor of this particular thing maybe would you want to give like more voting rights to people who have children uh no i, I think that's cringe should be adults but, but, but you, no. So for so for instance, let's say let's say that we we eliminated the material conditions that makes people of different demographic groups, um, you know, ca- capable of high, having higher and and lower levels of education, and um, also like so if, we, if we resolved racism as much as possible. What's that? If we resolved race, if we resolved racism and systemic whatever, right? Yeah. Well, and I, I would actually like to solve racism and systemic whatever. Glad um, to hear it. So so I would like to solve systemic racism and, and whatever. And then, yeah, I, I think that you should have a basic understanding of American history. You should have a basic understanding of our civics. You should have a basic understanding of voting and what it does. And you should also have a basic understanding of secondary and tertiary impacts of legislation. 100%. I'm pissed at you and now. You I'm, I'm, I'm going to be angry. If you don't understand the words that I said, then I don't want you to vote. I'm I'm super angry at you right now, and I'm super pissed because everything that you're saying shows what you oh. value, and essentially you're in favor of putting a lot of restrictions on the right to vote, yeah. but you don't want to put any restrictions on the right to bear arms. You don't want to have an assault weapons ban, fully automatic. You literally want to have I'm all okay these examinations. I'm, I'm okay with there being a higher tier for ownership for fully automatic weapons and destructive devices. Um, but but Pisco, do you do you know why I, I actually I prioritize it this way? It's because voting is like th- the state enforcing its edicts is violence. It's just violence extended through the state. So when you have incompetent, idiotic, moronic people voting for things that they don't understand, they're voting for other people with guns to enforce that. And by externalizing risk to a third party, especially an omnipotent, omniscient, you know, obviously the government isn't that. You sound like Anakin Skywalker right now. You sound like Anakin. Why? I haven't bought, bought, brought peace and justice to my new empire. You're like on a big gondola or whatever, or you're riding an animal, and you're like, 
I don't believe in democracy. I think people are stupid. I hate sand. That's what you sound like right now. No, I'll, I, I agree with all three of those things. You're like arguing for a monarchy or an Illuminati. Or a republic? Or a republic? What, what, what does a republic do, Pisco? What, what's the Both. difference between a straight democracy and a republic? As I understand the terms, a pure democracy is where the people directly vote on things, and a republic is where people vote on people to vote on things. Yeah, that's right. And make I decisions. Want a representative democracy. I want the best and brightest of the United States of America to become representatives of the interest of their constituents, and then I want to, them to vote both. I, I largely want them to vote their conscience in order to make sure that the republic is healthy and strong. Yes, that's correct. I believe in that. I am a Republican. Yeah. So Except you uh, would... These gun rights are to defend you from tyranny. This, this earlier, shouldn't be, this that should tyranny be a shock. People getting their voting rights taken away. Uh, like the tyranny I mean, of the no, educated not... and chosen over the, the non-educated and chosen, right? Uh, yeah. Yep, you're right. Mm -hmm. Yep. I, I believe that there is a, a I believe that there are different qualities of people more and less intelligent, more and less physically fit, <laughs> more and less educated, more and less everything. And I think that people should run for office, be elected by their peers, and then they should make decisions based off of their conscience in line with what they think is best for the whole. That's correct. So should the mentally, um, let's say the lower bottom 30 percentile of IQ be allowed to vote in America? No. <laughs> okay. okay what, As a matter of fact, I, I step away I, I, and I shit goes crazy. That, what happened? What did I miss? I would borderline say that's part of the problem. Is dumb people voting? Jesus yeah. Christ. Bro, what is wrong with you? You have problems. You want to give up like our democ our republic for guns. No, I don't. I want to maintain the republic through guns. Wait, how would the republic be maintained through guns? The, this is like I I gotta go. I was trying to entertain people while you were taking a <laughs> shit. And then you said that you would you think that the right to bear arms is more important than the right to vote. I I do. I absolutely do. And I also explained to you how. And I explained to, to you that the not important at all. No, I I think the right to vote is, is incredibly important because whenever you vote, you are voting for an exter an external authority to enforce your will. I think it's incredibly important. That's why I want to limit who has access to it. So if it's more important, why don't you vote for Trump? Wait, wait, wait. Sorry. You're going to have to explain to me your logic for that. Yeah, sure. You said that the right to bear arms is more important than the right to vote. Uh -huh. Donald Trump, for all his faults, I think, and for, I, did, I think he did try to limit some gun rights with the bump stock ban. But I do think in general he's more in favor of the Second Amendment than... Uh, or more favorite yeah, gun rights. Yeah, because he wants to destroy another. the entire order of things. Yeah, but the, you the, just the entire... said you'd rather that be, you, you'd rather vote for someone, or you'd rather have a situation in which you have a literal dictator. I asked you this question, you answered it. I asked, uh, would you rather have a dictator where you have guns, or a democracy with like less, much less guns, and or no guns? Well, you, you use said, the UK as an example. Yeah, I said America as a dictatorship or living in UK, and you said I would pick the dictatorship to live in. Yeah, and then the, the inference that I also explained to you earlier was the fact that there would be resistance to the dictator. And then also, what, what I would point to while, you know, also trying to get off the phone in the next few minutes, we can, we can table this for another time. Yeah. Um, but what I would say is, yeah, when you have the government interfering with people's access to finances because they're engaged in protest, I think that is fucked up. That's in Canada. And then when you have uh, people posting shit to social media, that would be legal in the United States, but they're being incarcerated for years in the United Kingdom. Yeah, I would rather take a dangerous country in which the, the right to keep and bear arms is available to all citizens and therefore there will be resistance to tyranny versus just being in a, a comfortable tyranny of the majority. Then move to Russia. 100%. What's that? Then move to Russia. That's a dictatorship. That's what you want here. Sorry. No. That's what you would choose not. here. That's why I'm not that's voting you... for Trump. 
Also, if you're also, Pisco, you have to bear in mind, I, I respect your intelligence and your ability to read things and argue passionately and all that kind of stuff. But you have to understand, like, do, do you think that your argument is nonsensical? So it, do you think that when the United States was first founded, was it not a republic? I think it was a republic. Yeah. Keep in mind, so if, it was so, founded so, before the uh -huh. Second Amendment. The Second Amendment is an amendment sure. to the Constitution. Hold on. Wait, we were founded yeah. as a democracy, too. Sure. I'm not, sure. I'm not arguing against that. What do we are? I don't know. But, but, but the fran but the franchise was limited in the early years. What franchise? Uh, the, the, ability right to vote. To the, the right to vote. The Republic was limited as well. Like, what, I don't understand sure. what the point is. Yeah. But so was the Second Amendment. The, I mean, the, the Second the point, Amendment didn't apply to any state regulations. And we didn't have that until 2010. <laughs> Actually, pretty sure Heller I, was I, 2009. I, I, idiot. Idiot. No, also, I'm pretty sure that you were earlier. You said that you weren't going to argue that it wasn't an individual right. I think I think it was. No, no, no. I'm not. It's not an individual right right now. I'm, what I'm saying is, the right has been. Was it? Was it before Heller? Was, before Heller, we did not have a Supreme Court case on point recognizing the Second Amendment as an individual right. I said I didn't want to get into that because it's a, it's a long argument. But it, but certainly oh. before before the 21st century that Second Amendment right was not incorporated to apply to state governments. We had cases in this, in various states, like Texas and others, that tried to, um, that limited the right to have access to guns, and the Second Amendment did not protect those abilities because everyone understood, initially, the Second Amendment did not apply to the state governments. Yeah, and well, so, what, what were the, do you have the examples of those limitations? Yeah, so Texas banned, I believe, in the 1860s, after the Civil War, when they had some Republican administrations, they banned certain open-carrying uh, the open carry possession of guns. The Sullivan Act in the 1890s in New York um, was is like the first modern kind of gun control statute. The Second Amendment did not protect against those things. Okay. Uh, yeah, sure. But I, I think that we would argue since then that, you know, the this, uh, this Constitution has been affirmed as like the supreme law of the land and that the phrasing of the se Second Amendment involves, you know, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. I'm not fighting you on that, Connor. What I'm fighting is that this okay. is more important than the right to vote and the foundations of our it republic. Is. You're acting as though the Second Amendment, as it is, is more important than the republic itself. It, I, I'm saying I'm saying it's foundational to the republic. So is the republic. The republic is foundational to the republic. If you lose the republic, but you don't, you if you keep the republic, but you lose the ability for the population to check the government. You only have like dictatorship in waiting. But if you, you're literally saying you prefer an actual dictatorship in presence. One which could be resisted against. I mean, you have to go. I have to go. You're, I'm you're, just you're, you're saying you're saying that I'm simping for Trump and I'm obviously not. I don't, I don't understand. I feel like what, what could if you lost the right to vote, wouldn't the next thing they take just be your guns? Well, if you think that if that was the America, only thing that meritocratic uh, ability to vote. He wants like a limited right to vote people who are intelligent enough, basically, right? And capable yes. enough. So the question is, is what do you do? How do you deal with the issue of people who uh, pass this intelligence threshold uh, only voting in their interests to basically kick the ladder away from underneath them so the people below them will never reach the right threshold to get uh, eligible to vote, which well, is basically I, what happens in those situations. Well, I don't think so. I think there's plenty of republics that have functioned with limited franchise, sometimes for thousands of years. Uh, but wait, the, what's wait, one? Wait, which which the republics lasted thousands of years of limited franchise? Oh, excuse me, I should have said hundreds. <laughs> excuse me. Which which republic lasted hundreds, hundreds of years of limited franchise? Rome. Rome lasted okay. hundreds and, of years as a republic. Is there anything in like recent history, like maybe the last thousand years? Okay, th this is this is something that I want you and uh, everyone to take away from this conversation, and also I I, I do have to run. And I'm yeah. happy to do, I'm happy, like, like very happy to have a conversation with anybody who wants to participate in this conversation, like at any time. Okay. I don't think that we are discrete creatures somehow evolved past the, the, like the political foibles of 2000 years ago. I think that technology and culture have evolved, but the way that human beings function has not. And so when you're saying like, oh, well, something recently or whatever, I think all of the problems of power and politics that existed 2000 years ago or 3000 years ago, I think they exist, exist exactly, almost exactly the same now.
like distribution of power, who's in charge, how do you balance power, what's the right of people to keep weapons, how do you deal with self defense? These are all problems of the ancient world as much as they are. Well, this is well, this is true. The problem with limited, the problem with these like limited uh, franchise republics, including the Roman Republic, is that you deal with a mass that is obviously very unhappy with that situation they're put in, which is why the Roman Republic didn't really get by without massive fucking suppression of slave rebellions and etc. Same with uh, even like in modern democracies, like in the UK, limited franchise meant you had people rioting and fighting to the fucking ends of the earth for their right to vote eventually and then they you know they, it just seems then to be we had julius caesar <laughs> it became a dictatorship well if if you guys uh if you want to come to me with a at a different time want to come to me with a historical argument that we should let retards vote because it's better in the long term <laughs> then i'll consider it well wouldn't the argument right. just be that america is the strong do we agree that america is the strongest most dominating country that's existed in the history of the planet or no well we're very young we're very young well, we're not, I mean, we have the oldest surviving constitution of any country that exists on the planet right now. I mean, technology's evolved well, listen, quite a bit in the this past. Is, this is part of the, this is where I feel like I'm getting gaslit. Are we on the verge of losing our republic to a dictator? Um, if you vote for Trump, maybe. Who knows? Maybe. The problem is Trump doesn't believe foundationally in things like democracy or like republic, republicanism is what it's called. Republicanism. But he doesn't believe yeah, in either of those things. Right? Yeah, and yeah, you recognize so, that, Connor. Connor, you recognize that and you say that I, I was going to say preferred. that. I, I was going to say Donald Trump philosophically is not a Republican. He's a populist right winger. So I cannot and will not vote for Donald Trump. But if a Democrat is promising me that they're going to undermine what I view as like a fundamental and foundational part of our country, then I can't in good conscience be like, oh yeah, lesser of two evils, let's go. Well, but when you say fundamentally undermine, them saying that I want Congress to pass legislation, that's not fundamentally undermining, right? Like we're talking uh, about like a movement that would involve the entire legislature passing listen, a law. I, to... I, I, I do feel it getting more interesting and I want to contribute. It's just that I legitimately do have other things I have to do today. Okay. So okay. at any point, if we want to reconvene the the cabal for this conversation i am happy to do so okay you're okay. a piece of crap damn it's okay please go fuck you i love you but i also hate you so goddamn much he say left. it back he left he, you son of a bitch he dipped. okay well then then destiny i love you and hate you in equal measure say it back okay i love you too be careful Take all care, right guys. Get you soon. Bye.